Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome to our inaugural edition of Writers to Watch. I'm Virginia Stanley, Director of Library Marketing at HarperCollins Publishers, and I'm joined by my colleagues. Hi, I'm Lainey Mays, Library Marketing Associate. Hi, I'm Grace Catanolo, and I'm the Library Marketing Assistant. So we're the library marketing team at HarperCollins, and this is our inaugural edition of Writers to Watch, which is a monthly program featuring authors talking live about their forthcoming books. And today we have the distinct honor of hosting four wonderful authors. We have Tao Tai, author of Banyan Moon, Gail Sukiyama, author of The Brightest Star, Nicole Chung, author of A Living Remedy, and Jasmine Hakes, author of Hula. So this is going to be conversational in tone. What we're going to do is ask each author to come on, speak briefly about their book, then we'll put them back into the green room, which means we're turning our camera off. And when all four authors are done speaking about their book and, and briefly describing it, we're going to bring everybody on and have a conversation, um, which we hope will be jump-started by your questions. So please have them ready. Type them into either the chat room on Facebook or Crowdcast, and we will get to as many as we possibly can. If at the end of the hour we don't have, we have more um, questions than we have time, the authors have agreed to stay on afterwards. We will record their answers to any questions that weren't answered, and uh, we'll make that bonus material for our podcast. So that's how this is going to go. So we're really excited about this. There is a catalog of all the books that are in the Facebook chat and also in the Crowdcast invitation, so be sure to ch check them out. And now we're going to start our program. Lainey and, and Grace, do you have anything to say before we get going? I have a little bit of a, a issue on Facebook. You might not see it live. I'm working on it, but Crowdcast is good to go. I'm very excited to be here and we have a lovely panel of authors. It's going to be fantastic. Good. Grace, all good? Just happy to be here. All right. So let's get started. The first author we're going to hear from is Tao Tai. Uh, Tao Tai, who is um, a writer whose work engages with tangled family relationships and the intersections of motherhood and identity. Uh, she's been nominated for multiple Pushcart Prizes and earned fellowships in creative writing. She's been published in Cup of Joe, Eater, Catapult, Sunday Long Road, and Long Read, excuse me, and others. I encourage you to check out uh, Tao's website, TaoWrites.com, where you will be treated to some of the most gorgeously written essays on everything from motherhood to marriage to Vietnamese cooking to the unexpected comfort of romance books. I promise it is so hard to pull yourself away from this site. Her debut novel, uh, Banyan Moon, coming out this June, is a sweeping debut novel following three generations of Vietnamese American women reeling from the death of their matriarch, revealing the family's inherited burdens, buried secrets, and unlikely love stories. Christina Baker Klein, author, number one New York Times bestselling author, calls Banyan Moon a celebration of life in all its forms and a joy to read. Welcome, Tao. Thank you so much, Virginia, and thank you everyone for having me here. I'm so pleased to be here, and I'm so grateful to be sharing more about Banyan Moon. Uh, so as Virginia said, Banyan Moon is a story about three generations of fierce, headstrong Vietnamese American women who love deeply and often recklessly. Anne Tran learns of her pregnancy on the very same night that her beloved grandmother dies. She must travel back to her crumbling childhood home, the Banyan House, in the swamplands of Florida, where she'll claim her inheritance and face her estranged mother. There, she discovers a photograph in a forgotten trunk that begins to unlatch secrets that have hung around the family for decades. Meanwhile, Anne negotiates what motherhood looks like for her, even as she feels bereft without her grandmother to guide her. This story travels through time to trace Anne's grandmother Min's journey as a widowed young mother during the Vietnam War, and then as an immigrant in America, struggling to make a home for her children. Interwoven is also Anne's mother's Hung's narrative about her fraught marriage to Anne's charismatic and violent father. 
The book is told through all three women's perspectives and it acts as a love letter to the survivors of love and war and heartbreak. It's also a tapestry of motherhood. Banyan Moon is the book that I've always wanted to write. I grew up with the echoes of my family's secrets, often overlapping and contradictory. No one could agree on the events of the past. And although it was really frustrating for me as a child, I think it taught me something about the stories we tell ourselves and each other. With the trans women, the common thread that holds them together is the instinct to protect each other, often through secret keeping. It's a complicated kind of love and one I wanted to explore and honor in Banyan Moon. This is a book for those who've struggled to find themselves with entangled family legacies and those who want to be transported to dangerously beautiful places. Thank you again for being here and for all the incredible work you do. Librarians like you have given me sanctuary and hope and the gift of stories that continue to shape me. And I, I'm just so grateful. And one day when I grow up, I want to be a librarian too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you will make a great librarian, Tao, because you're a fabulous wordsmith <laughs> and a wonderful storyteller. Um, okay, Tao, thank you so much. That's a wonderful setup. Uh, we will be back to have a conversation with all authors. So now you know a bit more about Banya Moon. And now we're introducing our next author, Gail Sukiyama. Gail Sukiyama was born in San Francisco to a Chinese mother from Hong Kong and a Japanese father from Hawaii. She's the best-selling author of The Color of Air, The Women of the Silk, and the Samurai's Garden. She's also the recipient of the Academy of American Poets Award and the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Award. She's the executive director of Waterbridge Outreach, which is a nonprofit organization that provides books and access to water in developing countries. And you can find more about that on our site. Uh, we've provided a link. It's waterbridge, waterbridgeoutreach.org. Gail's forthcoming book, The Brightest Star, is a historical novel based on the life of the luminous, groundbreaking actress, Anna Mae Wong, the first and only Asian American woman to gain movie stardom in the early days of Hollywood. Powerful, poignant, and infused with Gail's own cinematic touch, The Brightest Star reimagines this wonderful woman's life and uh, her very secrets. Uh, we have a great quote from Karen Joy Fowler, New York Times bestselling author, who says for all of her remarkable life, Wong struggled against the racism of Hollywood and the conservatism of her family. And through it all, the ups and the downs, the in-betweens, Sukiyama keeps her focus on Wong's bright, resi resilient spirit. A beautiful, haunting book. Welcome, Gail. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, my dear librarians out there. Um, as Tao said, I don't know where writers would be at without you librarians pushing our books when we are totally unknown. Um, I have so many library stories, and I wish I could tell you them, but I will talk a little bit about the new book, The Brightest Star. I feel that Virginia already gave you my, my points uh, already. Um, so I'm going to start the other way around. I, I was going to start by introducing you to Anna Mae Wong, but I'm going to tell you why I chose to write about Anna Mae Wong and, and the kismet and, and luck of suddenly her name being put out in the world again after so long of remaining silent. Um, uh, I was originally a film major and I wanted to make movies. I spent a great deal of my childhood watching movies and that's all I had done. And I remember watching this one movie called um, Shanghai Express. And there was Anna Mae Wong with Marlene Dietrich. And I, so ever since I was young, I'd known about her, but I didn't know of her. Um, so when the time came uh, uh, to trying to figure out what I wanted to write about, I started thinking more and more about Anna, Anna Mae Wong, her legacy, um, who she was, and, and how is she somehow connected to me, the writer now, here and now in the Bay Area. What? And so I started researching, um, which is always my go-to, um, start reading, and found out so much about her that I didn't know 
um, and how she got it started and, and how I would write this book. And I was incredibly fearful because I thought that I would have to write it in her voice and how can this girl, this woman in El Cerrito, California, write about Anna Mae Wong, um, who was both a Hollywood movie star and an international movie star, the first Asian American woman um, in early Hollywood, uh, and, and who had paved the way for all the, the Asian actresses and actors to follow in her footstep afterwards. Um, a friend of mine said, how come I never heard of Anime Wong? And I thought that was the kickstart. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna write something so that more people would read about Anime Wong, hopefully, in a fictionalized way. Um, and it was frightening because it was the first time I was writing about a real person. Um, and it was the first time that I knew that voice would be very important in this book because it would be her voice. And she had a tumultuous career. She had a tumultuous life. She made nearly 60 films. Uh, she began her first silent film, uh, The Toe of the Sea, at the age of 14 in 1919 and went on to make The Thief of Baghdad, uh, Peter Pan, and, and Shanghai Express. Um, she was set in terms of how everybody saw her and her talent to be a major Hollywood leading lady. And then it just fell apart. And it was because she was Asian American um, and could not get the roles of leading lady because of the anti-miscegenation laws at the time in which interracial relationships could not happen, both on screen and in life. Um, so she she had to take supporting roles, um, and she knew immediately that if she could not kiss a leading man on screen, she could never be a leading lady. Um, and she lived with that, but she not only lived with it, she tried to change it. And I think that's what makes her such a heroine for me, is that she never gave up. She kept trying to change the way Hollywood looked at, at Asians and, and any person of color. And she tried to get the roles that they would only give to Caucasian actresses in yellow face. Um, so it was fascinating, a fascinating world. Her world was fascinating. Um, she had triumphs and she had setbacks. Um, one after another, but she kept on going. And the most interesting thing, and I'll stop here, is when she not only fought against the racism of Hollywood, but the racism within her own culture and family. Um, she had many, many arguments with her family, especially her father, who equated being an actress to prostitution. Um, and so she had to overcome that also. So I think, you know, the, the beauty of being a writer is discovering, making discoveries. And I think that was one of the things that I didn't realize when I first began the book. And as I began writing, I realized, well, she fought many wars, both outside and on the home front. Um, but, you know, because she pursued this per, her, per, her professional ambitions against all odds, Anna Mae Wong, paved the way for Asian American actors today. Um, so I hope you like the book. I loved writing it. Um, I, I'm still fearful, but I, but I think I wrote the book that I wanted to write. And that's all a writer can do in the end. Thank you. Oh, Gail, that was perfect. And it is, it's such a beautiful book and it educates and it entertains and it informs and what you know, and we learn. Okay, Lainey, I hand it over to you, my friend. Hi, I love what you said. That's, that's all we, we can do as writers, just write the best book. Beautiful. I am here to introduce Nicole Chung. So welcome, Nicole. We're going to talk about your forthcoming memoir, A Living Remedy. Um, and you're also the national best-selling author of All You Can Ever Know, which was named a best book of the year by NPR, the Washington Post, Time, Library Journal, and over 20 other outlets. All You Can Ever Know was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and NABA Book of the Year, and semi-finalist for the Penn Open Book Award. It was a Barnes & Noble Discover, great new writer selection, Indie Choice Honor Book, all of these amazing accolades. Uh, your writing has been appeared in numerous publications, including New York Times, GQ, The Guardian, Vulture, and more. 
Um, you were born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, but you now live in uh, Washington, D.C. with your family. And your new memoir, A Living Mermaid, is heart-wrenching. It's poetic. And everyone who has lost someone or dealt with loss in these last few years can really um, connect to what you've written here. And thank you for writing it. Crystal Hannah Kim, author of If You Would Me, said this is a profound memoir that haunted and nourished me. I cried, I ached, I saw a path forward. Welcome, Nicole. Please tell us a little bit about your book. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Lainey. Um, and, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I feel you all must hear this all the time, but um, I love libraries so much. They've been a haven for me all my life, so much so I actually wrote about this in All You Can Ever Know about being that kid who begged for a library pass at recess. Um, the school library and my town library are the first places I ever saw myself as a child growing up in a town where I was the only Korean I knew um, long before I dreamed of being a writer. So I just want to thank you for um, being in these spaces, doing this work, nourishing um, voices and readers. Libraries are why. I have this career I love and I know I wouldn't be anywhere without your support and your work. So thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm still learning how to talk about a living remedy. I, I feel as though it's my whole heart uh, that everything I am is in this book. Um, but it's also scary, honestly, because it is not the book I thought I would be writing. <laughs> um, I had planned to write a memoir about home and my adoptive family and you know, the ravages of grief and financial precarity and healthcare inequality. Um, I started this book in the months after my father died when I was grappling not only with that loss, but also just the injustice of how he died so young at 67, um, largely because like too many people in our country, my father spent years unable to access the, the healthcare that he needed. And so his loss was, was obviously a cataclysm for me, but um, I was really struck one day when a friend was sharing some of her own family experiences with me and she said, you know, your father's death is such a common American death. And I thought about it and the fact that it really was in so many ways the result of this broken healthcare system that failed him like it fails so many others over and over. Um, and I realized that I was sort of missing the language to talk about that, but that was where a lot of my anger and grief came from as well. Um, you know, we often hear illness and death referred to as equalizers, as if these things can flatten our privileges and our disparities just because in time they come for all of us. Um, but what I learned and what so many other people who've, who've lost someone have learned is that these crises don't transcend our differences so much as sometimes magnify them. And we've seen continuous proof of this right throughout the COVID pandemic. Um, if you don't have rainy day savings or paid medical leave, if your support system is under-resourced or stretched thin or non-existent, if you can't access life-saving care and treatment when you need it, um, of course, that has an, an impact on your life, your quality of life, um, the kind of care that you can get and how your loved ones are able to support you. So after my father died, I was reading all these books about grief and um, and feeling really thankful, you know, for the company of those stories. But I also couldn't help but notice how many of them were sort of filled with people who were often white, upper middle class, like their, their choices and realities didn't necessarily reflect like my family's experience or the experiences really of most Americans who face illness and loss. And so I wanted to write this book in part because it was the one I needed and, and one that I hope others with similar experiences and losses will be able to see their own lives and their own families and their own hopes and burdens in. Um, you know, for much of my childhood, as I write in the book, my family sort of got by paycheck to paycheck. But by the time I graduated from high school, you know, I knew what it meant that when someone got sick or lost a job, so like that sense of stability would disappear overnight. Um, and I really went off to school across the country still sort of believing in this bootstrapping myth I'd been raised with that I would work hard and pay my dues and then I would be able to help my family. Um, but a lot of a living remedy is grappling with the fact that I thought we had time that we didn't have. And so I wanted to reflect on you know, what it means to try to help and support and take care of each other, our families, our communities, when we're often caught in these systems that fail or dehumanize us. Um, you know, when we don't have the resources we need, when people are suffering. 
and how we still attempt to support and carry and love each other, you know, through these things. Um, I wanted to write about the distance between who we were and who we've become, the distance between home and where we end up, the distance between what we want to be able to do for our loved ones and what we find is possible. When I first started working on this book, I thought it would be mostly focused on my grief for my father. I didn't know that my mother and I were about to face another emergency or that a pandemic would follow and change everything. So um, my mother was diagnosed with cancer the year after my dad died. And then not long after that, the whole country went into COVID lockdown. Um, and, and so our lives changed. Everybody's lives changed. The world changed. And at that point, the book I'd planned to write was really gone. And A Living Remedy became our story in many ways, the story of my mother and me. Um, and this book is very much about my family's experiences. Obviously, it's a memoir. But I've always been aware of that we're not really alone in these experiences. So many people have or will find themselves like in the sandwich generation, parenting young kids while trying to take care of elders or sick parents. Um, so many people struggle to have hard discussions about money and healthcare and end of life decisions and what is possible. Um, and I really wanted to write about these things, honestly, and about the ways we still belong to each other and still love each other. Um, and these scary spaces we have to learn to navigate. Um, so, I mean, in the end, this book isn't, of course, what I thought I would write, but um, it's a story that's kind of changed completely in the writing of it. I, I think of it, I sometimes say like it represents a process um, and it's also about a process because that's what grieving is. We don't ever get over loss. We don't, we can't replace the people we love who are gone, but we can keep them close and honor them. You know, we can learn grace and care for ourselves at any age. And much of this book too is about recognizing like the right and need to forgive ourselves and each other for what we can and can't do and recognize the right to grieve and the importance of it. Um, because loss makes our lives into something new, but sometimes it is possible to learn to see and understand and even cherish that new life in spite of what you've lost. My greatest wish for this book is that it, it will help readers, especially those who may have experienced similar precarity or grief or distance from home and loved ones. Um, I hope it will help some people feel less alone. As a memoirist, I believe this genre justifies its existence by meeting people where they are, by reaching out to readers, by helping them think about and make connections to their own lives and their own stories. And in the case of this book, their own losses. So that's that's really my deepest wish for it is that um, that it will help some readers feel less alone. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Thank you. I have to say I'm I am in that camp of lost someone during this, and it, it really did connect to me. And I think that it's probably a, a hard thing to sit down and write, but I, I love what your reflections on grief and, and forgiveness. So thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Lainey. I'm going to hand it over to Grace to introduce our next book. Thanks, Lainey. I'm excited to introduce Jasmine Iolani Hayes, the author of Hula, which is coming May 2nd, 2023. Jasmine Iolani Hayes was born in Hilo, Hawaii. Her essays have appeared in the Los Angeles Times and the Sacramento Bee. She is a recipient of the Best Fiction Award from the Southern California Writers Conference, a Squaw Valley Foundation Scholarship, and a Writers Writing by Writers Emerging Voices Fellowship and a Hedgebook Residency. Dance has always been um, central to Jasmine's life and creativity. She took her first hula class when she was four years old and has danced for the esteemed Halo Okekuhi and the Tahitian troupe Hei Tiare. She worked throughout college as a professional luau dancer and she lives in California. Hula is this beautifully written immersive story about Hii who hopes to become the next Miss Aloha Hula. And I'm going to let Jasmine talk more about that. But before I do, I wanted to read this beautiful quote by Kawawe Strong Washburn, the, Washburn, the author of Sharks in the Times of Saviors. A full-throated chant for Hawaii, part coming-of-age story, part historical family epic, all love. The pages fly by amidst fluid, furious language and captivating drama. This book breathes new life into island narratives. It's impossible to come away unchanged. Jasmine, tell us more about your book. 
me start my video here. Thank you so much for having me and including me and all of these authors are so amazing. So I'm just honored to be a part of this. And I will continue the library love by saying I spent half of my high school years only going to school in the morning so I could shelve books in the afternoons at the Gila Public Library, which meant shelving my books as quick as I could and then just reading anything that I could get my hands on. So I love what you do. It's been my saving grace. And I'm just in very large appreciation that you exist. Anyway, um, so Hula at its surface is about a girl who aspires to be the world's next great hula dancer by winning the Miss Aloha Hula competition. Um, her mother and her grandmother are both renowned hula dancers and community leaders. So she sees this as her birthright. But when it comes to light that she's not her mother's child by blood, the question of whether she can claim this sacred tradition um, becomes uh, something that not just the family has to grapple with, but the entire community. Um, so when I started writing Hula, it's it, it was kind of an interesting thing because Hawaii is a place that so many people feel familiar with. Um, they've come or they know about it or they've seen it or they've read it. And uh, but in my experience, few have really experienced it. And and the story that I wanted to write required a certain amount of code switching and interpretation, um, the same kind of things you would do if you were reading a story set in a country you know nothing about or traveling abroad. Um, Hawaii has such a complex social fabric and such a deeply rooted culture. So writing about this, I wanted to not give you a tour guide uh, that's kind of skimmed the surface of what Hawaii is about, but I wanted to kind of in invite you into our home and let you kind of sit and observe. And so it takes things like hula and um, other contexts that uh, uh, concepts that have been very widely used uh, everywhere and give it kind of new context and meaning. Um, like the concept of aloha, it's not just about being welcomed with open arms, you know, it's about sharing and reciprocity. And um, in spite of some rumors, Hawaii isn't wholly necessary, they're not necessarily against visitors, but a lot of visitors come and take that aloha without offering anything in return. And and I'm not talking monetarily, it's more about um, coming here with the simple understanding that Hawaii is more than a destination paradise. It's it's um, it existed long before it was a state. And so I think I, I that was partially one of the challenges and beautiful things about writing about my home. Um, but it was also partly um, an interesting thing to do because in order to write Hee's story, I had to kind of tap into all the vulnerabilities that I grew up with looking the way I do and being constantly questioned of whether I was local. I come from a very local family and I grew up on Hawaiian homelands and surrounded by everyone who did not look anything like me. And so I think I grew up with the, all those questions of who belongs and who gets to say. And so um, within the context of trying to introduce the world to my home and its complexities, I, it was it, the story is also kind of my personal exploration of these unanswerable questions of um, who belongs and kind of really who gets to say. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy it. Wow. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Gail, Nicole and Tao. If everybody can turn their cameras on, now's the time for for chatting. This worked out well. We've got time now to answer questions and to, you know, just have a conversation around Robin, a, a, you know, of exchange of ideas. And so thank you all so much for giving us just enough to uh, wet the whistles for your books with no spoilers. Um, so Lainey, do you want to pull the first question that we can ask of all the authors? Yes. So let me bring it up because I put it aside when I was looking at Facebook and Crowdcast. So let one second. Um, um 
Yes. Just want to say while Lainey's pulling that up, we just have so much love for everyone in the chat. Um, people are just singing praises for all of you. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, just one second. Okay, here we go. We got <laughs> there. It just took me a second. Um, live TV, everyone. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for all of you. I think it's a good kind of starting off and I, I'll point to somebody to start so that we're not all like, who's going? But the question I think puts all of our books together in one thought, one theme. So when I was reading all of your books, I think the, the theme that comes is this quote unquote American dream. It's this running through, whether it's, you know, immigration or fitting in or healthcare or colonization. Um, I think that is something you can kind of talk about in each of these books, but how does each of, how do each of your books take on this promise or maybe failing of this American dream? Um, and I think we'll start with Jasmine. Well, it's, it's a kind of an interesting thing because um, I grew up, I was born and raised here and I was educated here. And the only thing I ever learned about Hawaii throughout high school was the year it became the 50th state and and we were taught at that time a lot has changed since but at that time i'm aging myself um the the success was moving away and getting that job and getting that house and because that was everything that we were taught what we supposed to what we're supposed to be striving for and and so this book does actually really grapple with that of like what what are we supposed to be working towards and and what does that look like and and while under the the you know looming united states is still some people would say occupying hawaii um and and so that american dream of coming here and and uh you know getting a cheap house and 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 just living off the land and everything like that we've kind of had to redefine that in hawaii for ourselves over the years and um and so yeah that 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 search to to try to find a balance within that is very much a part of of of, of this story so um, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense when you talk about home that that really resonates with me as well. I think um, for my family and many other immigrants and in, in my community, one of the things that um, was so integral to the American dream was this idea of having something to leave to your descendants. Um, this idea of being able to pass something tangible along. Um, and for me, and in the Banyan house, that came in the form of this crumbling old um, southern manor that was a combination of all these different styles kind of smushed together. Um, I, I remember like growing up in, and being um, taking these rides down these historic neighborhoods and seeing these beautiful places that have been in families for decades or even longer um, and thinking, we didn't have something like that in America for ourselves and what would that look like and um, for an immigrant to have like a an ancestral home to to kind of pass along in that way. And so in Banyan Moon, a lot of the idea of the American dream centers around um, what is what is the gift that I'm leaving behind for my children and my grandchildren? Um, and that's really the idea of that, the legacy that they're all chasing in different ways. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's a very fraught question um, and it's one that doesn't have an easy solution, I think, because we're all constantly trying to negotiate what home even is, um, much less what home we pass along to others. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of the the central focus of Banyan Moon, I think. Um, Gail, yes. Um, gee, I, I'm coming from the different a different direction since I'm jumping into somebody else's life, which I thought was incredibly interesting because she was third generation American. Her parents were born here. Her grandparents were born in America, but they were never treated like Americans. Um, 
And when she was ready to go be a grand, great movie leading lady movie star, um, she was always treated like she wasn't an American. Um, and from the other side, her family, they held her back, you know, I mean, in terms of traditions and what you should do and you shouldn't do, even though they were second generation Americans, which I found fascinating, you know, because I mean, you look at it and you're wondering, they were here for this long, but America imposed all these restrictions on them. So they never felt American. So of course, they're not going to want their daughter to go out, and, you know, and, and be an actress and you know, in Hollywood. Um, but she was stuck in a situation in which she was too Chinese to be American and too American to be Chinese. Um, and I found that really fascinating. That was like the core of the book to a large extent. She didn't, you know, beyond everything, she found the most peace when she was in front of the camera, not being herself, when she could be somebody else. Um, and and I think all of that uh, played into the book. And it's always so subconscious because I don't sit there thinking deep thought, deep thought now, you know, um, I've got to put this in. I think that it just kind of writes itself the more you know about the character and their situation. Um, but certainly the American dream for her was so complex because she had these two warring sides always within herself. You know, she didn't know if she was truly American and she didn't know if she was truly Chinese because of, of how they both sides treated her. Um, and I think that's in a way the core of the book and, and how she lives through it and keeps persevering throughout that. And then Nicole. Thank you. Um, I love everybody's answers. It gave me so much to think about. I was like taking notes. Um, it's a little bit different in my book, uh, you know, because it's a memoir. It's it's I'm looking at it through like a very personal lens. But my my adoptive parents, uh, who are white, unlike me, uh, they they are both from Ohio and they struck out west. Like they were both raised in large families, and nobody could believe they were leaving. But they were the ones who left home. They went uh, to the other side of the country first to Alaska and then to Washington oh. State and then to Oregon. Um, oh, thank you for this picture. <laughs> that's us. That's my sailor suit. Um, but it was I love because, the hairstyles. Thank you. I had like the stick up straight Asian hair and then eventually the bowl cut. Somehow, <laughs> even though my parents were not Asian, they knew. Um, but like that was kind of indicative of their whole lives, the way they struck out like for adventure. They really believed in opportunity and taking risk. And they saw they actually didn't see things as risks that other people would like my adoption, for example, like nobody in their family had ever adopted. I don't think my parents like really knew any Asians or had Asian friends, but like this was something they very much wanted to do and believed they were meant to do. Um, and, you know, I have sort of a different view of my adoption than they always have, but I, I view that decision they made as like yet another example of them building their dream, like this American dream that they believed in. Um, you know, and I think that's how they raised me too. And that's kind of why I also went really far from home with that that bootstrap myth I mentioned growing up with earlier. And, and what we eventually all learned is just that, you know, this dream that you can secure through hard work, everything your family may need or want, um, you know, that we live in a meritocracy where that kind of thing happens is 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 not really true all, or all the way true. And I think kind of reveals itself as a, as a, a bit of a house of cards in a lot of people's lives. And yet that myth still has so much power, like so much cultural cachet. It's still a story we're telling in many ways, we are still passing it on to our children. And, and you know, I'm not interested so much in black and white, up or down, is that right or wrong necessarily? But I do hope, think one thing perhaps you can get from many of our stories and, and what I hope some people pick up on in A Living Remedy um, is like the importance of maybe questioning some of those dominant narratives, those cultural stories that we're still passing on, you know, is there a more complicated, more accurate, maybe more painful, but true story about this country, about dreams that we can be sharing with our kids, you know, that that still gives them hope, but is also makes room for the nuance, makes room for the complication and makes room for um, like the persistent inequalities we're still facing. Um, so, I mean, I think that's just kind of like one way that I think about the American dream is in the context of my, my own story. I 
do you find it interesting that each book really does talk about that thing you, that you pass on, what you were just saying, you pass that on through every generation and kind of all of your books are like in history <laughs> where you can kind of look at it from different views. You know, I, uh, when we first did the, uh, the, the, our sort of informal meet and greet, you know, it was just so interesting to talk to all of you for the first time about this program and, and also the sort of this like connective, connective tissue between all of these these books and the people in them, fiction, nonfiction, it's still uh, very uh, compelling stories. And um, there's so much love here uh, for for all of these books. Great excitement. Somebody said, I don't even know which one to read first. That's the problem when you have all these wonderful books and you're presented with these great options. Um, one question, um, we're going to get to a question for each author. It goes faster than you think. Uh, but Janet Lockhart uh, has a question for um, Gail. Uh, she said, the section of the book that detailed what happened with the casting of The Good Earth was infuriating and heartbreaking. Um, she very much enjoyed The Brightest Star. She went looking for the Shanghai Express after finishing it. It was sad, sad to find it unavailable. Question mark. Hope it changes. Oh, you're muted, Gail. You mean the movie Shanghai mm -hmm. Express? She couldn't find it. It's actually online. She can, if she plugs in the Shanghai Express, it'll show her where she can watch the movie on on the on a website. So Janet, if that's what you're talking about, there you go. If you need to clarify that, um, please do. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so much richness to read here. Everybody, Tony Nako wants to read them all. Casey Davis, such diverse books. The problem with these with this presentation, says Allison Corcoran, is which book to read first. And we're glad that they're all here for you. Um, and so, uh, and a great excitement for um, Banyan Moon. Can you tell us a little bit more about Banyan Moon? Just a few things that you haven't already said about Banyan Moon. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that um, I really loved about writing this book was that th all three generations have such different voices and perspectives. So um, it, it it was really hard for me to to pick a favorite. I'm always trying to pick favorites of everything, like my favorite thing to eat, my favorite thing to drink. And with these characters, I just I love them all. And I think um, one thing I really enjoyed about um, Min, the grandmother's perspective, is that so much of her life was set in Vietnam. Um, she grew up there during the war and she fell in love there. She had uh, made some really big decisions there, um, opened a store, was a businesswoman at a time when that was perhaps a little more rare. Um, and being able to to research the texture of Vietnam, just um, everything from the topography to the history to like the sensory um, experience of being there at that specific time that um, was so engrossing to me. And I got to put so much of that in the book. Um, and I've been to Vietnam, I've been back to Vietnam to visit a few times, um, but it, it gave me such joy to be able to connect with it through the research and um, to, to bring it alive in the book that way. Um, so I think that's probably the part that I'm really excited about, um, about bringing to readers too, that, um, not just the interweaving of the plot lines, but also the landscape. Um, landscape in this book, um, you've got like the the swamp lands, which are dangerous and you know really gothic um, and dark. And then you've got these, the the ocean, which is broad. Um, and then the landscape of Vietnam too. And it all just ties together in a way to me that that um, felt like cinematic as I was writing it as well. So I, I'm just really excited for you to experience that. And thank you for, for the question. Can you, as long as we, and then we'll bop to the next uh, author, but um, can you talk a, a little bit about Chu Khoi, The Man in the Moon, which is the, the, the Vietnamese folktale that's passed down from Karen? Yeah, definitely. So, um, one of the tropes running through the book is the the banyan tree um which is referred to as an invasive species and um it exists in vietnam and it exists in a few places in america and, and florida is one of them and um there is a vietnamese myth about chukoi 
And uh, it's it's about this man who discovers the healing properties of um, a banyan tree, and he is able to use the leaves to bring people back to life. Um, and it's he thinks of it as like this gift from the gods, and it wins him great acclaim, great riches. He marries the most beautiful woman um, in the in the world, and um, they have this great life. Uh, but then one day, while he's away traveling, his wife. Um, um, accidentally cuts into the tree and so the tree begins to um, uproot itself it's already like sort of this scraggly um, gothic thing and it, it begins to uproot itself and fly towards the ceiling and he though he has this like beautiful life um, at with his family and his great success he watches this tree flying up to the sky and he's so heartbroken and enraptured by the prospect of losing it that he just clings to it and he he's taken up um into the moon where he becomes the man in the moon um and i, I just love that legend so much because it references you know this the landscape as i think virginia was um saying but also because it, it references this this blindness of hope you know when you are when you are seeing yourself reflected in in an object or a thing or a home or a person uh, and it starts to slip away you you have this urge to to cling on even more and it, it's such a beautiful like evocative visual tale to me and it it, it really belonged in the book because it, it's part of what guides the uh, the psychic development of these women as well oh i think you're muted virginia If Virginia doesn't have anything to say, I'll move on to the next question. <laughs> uh, Jasmine, you talked a bit earlier about how the U.S. education system really does fail people in talking about um, Hawaii and its its history before um, U.S. occupation. And I I learned so much from your book, and I wish you could have seen me. I was like I was googling while I was reading um, different words, different historical events, and um, I just wanted to ask a little bit. And I know, I know you grew up in Hawaii, so. What, did you have to do supplemental research or was this based off of lived experience? Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, I, well, uh, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, originally, I had written just a very simple story about this girl who wants to be a hula dancer and all that implies within their family. And as I was going through the edits, people kept saying, well, why do they, ha why does the grandma have this opinion? And why does this person have this opinion? And those things were based very much on my lived experiences. Those opinions were based very much on my experiences. And the, towards the second half of the book, uh, you know, the community is fighting a development coming into my hometown of Hilo. And, um, and that is something that I lived and I had all these memories, but I couldn't in order to write it, I couldn't really just say, and then this happened and just because, you know, and, and so I did have to go through and kind of teach myself Hawaiian history. And thankfully there have been a number of people and scholars uh, here that have gone through the motions of putting those things down. We, we were an oral culture. And so, so much that was written was written by missionaries and it was whitewashed or, or painted over and simplified or extremely misunderstood. And so thankfully I had those, they're fairly new resources, but learning the history was for myself, just all the context put my own life in, you know, in kind of a whole new perspective. And so it was, it was really gratifying to be able to, um, it, the eighties, so much happened in Hawaii, it, you know, it, 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 Hawaiians and locals were learning our own history because it had been told to us as it was happening, people were saying, no, that didn't happen. No, that's, that's not what we're doing. The queen is in prison, but no, that's, that's not what you're really seeing here. And so to be able to kind of reclaim our history was, has been this incredible thing. I, I mentioned in the book that, you know, there was a, there was a period of time where about 50 people in our entire state spoke fluent Hawaiian. 
because we had no curriculum, we had no way of learning about our history. It wasn't written about. And, and so down the road, a bunch of my cousins work now at, at one of the first charter schools and all of my nieces and nephews are fluent. I go on Hawaiian airlines and the stewardesses are speaking to each other in Hawaii. So it, it's pretty, for me, just in writing it, you know, I've had that same, I've, I'm sharing that same experience where I come home and it, it, it's like, I can appreciate it all that much more, all those little details, you know. Wow. Um, so Nicole, I have a question from our friend Lillian Dabney about um, how maybe, maybe how cathartic it was to, to write all of this, but I also, I'm going to add to that question because I'm sure that it opens up that's like me while ago, opens up for people to come tell you their stories. How do you feel, what are your ideas of how that's going to be maybe at book readings and stuff? Like, does the catharsis continue with people sharing their stories or is it, I don't know how you feel. Um, thank you so much for the question. So uh, I'm one of those writers who doesn't tend to think of writing as catharsis or therapy. This is for me personally. Um, with my first book, I needed it's, it's the story of growing up as a transracial Korean adoptee and what happened when I decided to search for my birth family as an adult, which coincided with the birth of my own first child. And um, I was like several years past the search when I wrote the book and that was on purpose. Like for me, I felt like I needed that time. I honestly wouldn't have been ready to write it before. Um, I had to do like a lot of my own work first and, and then I was able to write the book and go out and promote it. And, and I think to your second you know, question, um, I felt really honored to, I mean, so honored. As soon as the book was out, I started hearing from like multiple adoptees a week from like the ages of 10 and 11 up and through their 80s and 90s, like adoptees of every background and race. And it was and from countries all over the world. And it, it just, um, it felt like such an honor that they would reach out and share their stories. And people would come up to me at events sometimes sobbing and saying like this is the first time I've seen anything like my experience in literature um, and I won't lie it was also sometimes like emotional labor to sit and listen and talk and hold those stories um, I would sometimes uh, get on the phone like with adoptees that I didn't know just to like talk and listen um, but I did feel and I still feel very um, grateful to them for for sharing with me so generously for trusting me with that and also as an, adop an adoptee I feel less alone when they do that I it always reminds me that we're legion like there are so many of us um and this next book is very different right but I think um you know I don't know anybody who hasn't experienced some kind of loss or like at least deep disappointment or some small grief over the last few years especially um I I can only imagine that I'll end up hearing like a lot of stories uh, from people about people that they've lost or people they miss or or things they weren't able to do during the pandemic or um, times they felt a really painful distance from home or wanted to help someone and they couldn't and needed to forgive themselves for that. So um, I, I, I know that will happen and I'm um, trying to emotionally prepare, but I think it will be a real honor again to hear and to hold those stories with people. Um, it's it's actually like a, a very great compliment to me as a writer. Um, but yeah, I if I could real quickly too, just say like the book wasn't exactly cathartic, but I think I had to show myself a great deal of grace and care in writing it. Uh, like I did not just push myself through hard traumatic things. There were plenty of times I took breaks of weeks or months um, there were times I just knew, like, I knew what a chapter was going to need and I wasn't ready to do it. So I didn't. And that's, it's actually the first time in my whole writing life that I have done that for myself because the subject matter just demanded it. Um, so I'm actually very grateful to this book, not for being catharsis, but for teaching me how to care for myself in the writing and recognize that sometimes the writing is the care that you have for yourself. Um, so thank you for that question. Oh, that's beautiful. What a beautiful answer. Oh, um, I, okay. I have to tell people that Lisa, uh, librarian Lisa Casper said, Shanghai Express is available on DVD on Amazon. And the daughter of Shanghai, which was a favorite of Anna's, is available to watch via the Internet Archive. I watched it the other day, which made Janet Lockhart very happy. Um, 
<laughs> um, I would like to go back for a second as we as we sort of wind up here um, on the at the, the, the top of the hour. Um, I wanted to show the um, image of the quarter uh, when the U.S. Mint had this uh, this um, new program out honoring women and Anna Mae Wong. This is extraordinary. Just absolutely beautiful. Uh, and Gail, you know, Anna Mae Wong, her her accomplishments and her acknowledge her, you know, her her achievements are sort of, <laughs> I don't know, they're they're there is a resurgence. I wish there hadn't been a resurgence. I wish it was it was already there. But here here she is, this beautiful woman on the face of a US minted currency. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Oh, you're you're muted. I'm you're muted. Together. I'm unmuted. Um, yes, you know, I tried to buy the rows of quarters when I found out that they were coming out with it through the US Mint. And they were all sold out. They had wow. sold out. And I was on a waiting list and I never got any. And I thought, oh, not meant to be. What can you do? Um, and I, I'm shopping at Trader Joe's. <laughs> and I, I'm probably one of the few people that still uses cash. Because then I can keep track of how much I'm spending on food that I don't need, right? So I, I'm paying cash and she gives me back change. And I look down and I've got three anime Wong quarters in the palm of my hand. And I thought that was so weird. And I was almost going to pull out a $5 bill and say, can I buy the rest of them that's in there? But, you know, there was a whole line of people waiting. Um, so that's wow. my anime quarter. Yeah, you know, I mean, I again, you know, writing what you write about is always a surprise in every way. Because I, when I began thinking about this, so many people hadn't heard of anime Wong. Mm. Um, there have been great articles about anime Wong, but I, I don't know how many people have seen them, you know, because I've read through everything in writing the book um, and I wish more people had. So I was hoping this book would direct them. And then all this came out, the quarters, the this, the movie that's coming out with Gemma Chan, you know, all these things were right. coming out. And I could only hope, you know, get that book out there. Um, you know, and hope that I've done it in a way that will complement everything else that's happening in her life. Mm -hmm. So well deserved after so long. Please. Can I say something? Yes, I'm so please. jealous of your quarter story. So that same <laughs> program, um, Edith Kanaka Ole is on a quarter, and the Edith Kanaka Ole Stadium is where we hold the Miss Aloha Hula um, competition every year, and she is the founder of Halau Kekuhi, the, the, the Halau that I taught under. And so I studied hula under her granddaughter. And so I, same thing. I mean, I haven't gotten oh, lucky yet. I got to go to Trader Joe's and pay a cash okay, more. But if, <laughs> if I get one, if I get one, I'll give it to you. Everybody <laughs> has to be on the lookout for the, Edith. there she is. Found it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> If I, get so one, if I get one from Trader Joe's, I will give it to you. I'll, I'll track <laughs> you down. <laughs> I also want to say Nicole just told us that she wrote a piece for Vulture about the long lost TV show, the gallery, uh, the, the anime Wong TV show. So I'm putting that link, Nicole, in in the chat so everybody can get links. I don't know if you want to talk about it. But... Oh, sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to like steal any thunder, but I wanted to tell you like, um, and Gail, I wanted to send it to you. I'm so excited about your book because I wrote this reported piece trying to find out more about this long lost show. She was an art gallery owner who solved crimes. Yes. Um, yeah, you probably know like all about it, but I didn't really know. And I was trying to track down like film historians or anybody who may have ever seen a clip. Um, apparently the tapes were dumped in the river. So yeah, they were dumped in the Hudson River. I, yeah. you know, and nobody has ever found one of them. Yeah. And you know how easy it would have been just to digitize everything now. It's so sad to think, you know, but I mean, it was historical. What right. Asian American woman at that time in the 50s gets her own TV show? Yeah, apparently they dumped like most of the shows from that network, yeah, which doesn't yeah, exist I anymore. So. But I, I, I still think about it sometimes like, man, <laughs> anime Wong on a procedural sounds pretty I know, good. I know. She would have been a cool detective too. I can imagine her. Yeah. I love this. This is what we were hoping for. Just, you know, <laughs> if only we were in the same room now. <laughs> well, we, we, sort of, we sort of are. Raise a glass <laughs> to all of you. And we thank you so much 
for Thank you for having us being our our inaugural guests on this show uh you know we thank you and we so appreciate your taking the time and and uh sharing these stories uh, your stories with us um and um you know we have a few seconds left if anybody has anything they want to say that they haven't said please feel free while i drink my non-alcoholic beverage Well, it was a pleasure for me to meet all three of you. And I hope that we'll stay in touch one way or another through, you know, it's just, it's good. I love seeing your faces and I love that you're writing books. As as we, as I said, when we met the very first time, you know, how wonderful it is that our books keep being published. Um, you know, because I don't know, 30 years ago, it wasn't happening, you know, and that's not a long time. Um, but it, it keeps happening and, and more and more voices and your lovely voices. Um, and, and, you know, I've never been in a, in a pan or a group of, of where, where we're all Asians that we've written books just in the same, as you said, we're writing books on the same themes um, and it's been a lovely experience. So thank you, ladies. Nice to meet you all. And I hope we keep in touch. Absolutely. I share the same sentiment. Thanks, everyone. Such a pleasure. Thank you all. And thank you, Lainey, Virginia, and Grace. Uh, yes, for ladies. For putting this together. Yes. Library yes. ladies. <laughs> We're going to have to give you a better, cooler name than library ladies. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> I think it's cool. <laughs> We're the okay. library love fest team, sharing the love. <laughs> Oh. Your immense pleasure. Just saying, like this is this is a complete pleasure and a wonderful way to end our day, and a great way to kick off the new program. I'm just so thrilled that uh, all of you were able to make it today and share with us. Yes. Yeah. Thank and we're you. honored to be in the first inaugural program. Absolutely. Well, you're going down in history. Thank you. <laughs> do I get a, do? Will we get quarters? Yes, <laughs> one day. That's what I wanted. It's know. a consolation mm -hmm. prize. Okay. <laughs> pennies. We'll be on pennies. <laughs> pennies. You all get a DVD. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, uh, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. We've loved every minute of it, learning from these brilliant authors and their stories. And, uh, you know, it's a uh, it's just been a beautiful hour and uh, we can't thank them all enough. And we can't thank you all enough for chiming, to, to, for joining and watching and listening and learning. It's been lovely. So thank you very much. And we'll be back next month with another episode of Writers to Watch. And until then, take care and be well. Bye-bye all. <laughs>